Podcast. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode, and I'm calling this one Building Up Steam. Yes, you heard me correctly, Building Up Steam. And to have us walk through this conversation, I have Mary Bruce Clemens, and she's the industrial control technician at TW Controls. And she liked. She told me she said, "Make sure you say this. I'm an alternative education enthusiast, and I love it because this this topic of about steam is something that we haven't talked about before. Uh, it's new for our listeners, so very excited. So, Mary, welcome. How you doing today? Good. How about yourself? I'm doing great. Doing great. Looking forward to this conversation. And, and when when I first met you and you brought in uh, the topic of steam, it caught me off guard because I'm used to STEM, not used to that A. So, make, can you explain to the listeners out there? that may be new, what STEAM is? Absolutely. It's actually a, a pretty contentious topic in, in the science and technology world to have that A thrown in. Uh, STEM is an acronym to sum up a, a, a subject of studies, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, and part of the contention is that that A, when you throw that in there, that brings uh, the arts. And so, uh, the arts can be a whole lot of different things. It's a pretty subjective definition on what it is. And I think that that's probably where the contention comes from uh, because it, it can't really be narrowed down as to what it is. But in our engineering fields and everywhere else, we use the, we use the arts every every day. Right. You know, I know you, you were so passionate when we were talking about the A. So what is, you know, why do you feel that A is such an important element? That's the first introductory point of personal interest that I think that anybody can get when they're going to study science, technology, engineering, and math. Before we have language, we have art. Uh, and until we learn language, that's how we communicate with crayons, with whatever we can do, smashing up, uh, you know, buttercups on the ground to, to draw pigments. That's the first part of manual literacy that any of us ever become familiar with. Uh, so when we're toddlers and we're trying to stick square pegs in round holes and we figure out that square pegs go to square holes, that's the beginning of engineering. That's the beginning of, of all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to, to not include it, uh, in my opinion, is something that is uh, unfortunate because I think that a lot of those folks that think in a binary concept, they, they think that they're not good at being creative, but they're problem solving every day. Um, and so to exclude that as being a lesser than uh, area of study is, is sad because that's how we still communicate about it. Right. I am, I am curious, like how long has the, the, the STEAM initiative, or I guess that's the, even the right terminology, been out there? Is this relatively new, adding that A? Because, I mean, I've hear, heard about STEM for forever. And that's, uh, I mean, it's definitely been a, a heavy part of the conversation since the early 2000s, um, possibly even before that. So it's been a long term, both in academia and in the field, all, all, all the way around, you know. Um, and I think really the people that kind of experience art through science and science through art are the ones that are probably the ones that are not dropping the mic on it. Um, we, you know, a, a big, a big part of, of the scientific field would be photography that didn't, that didn't get invented until like 1839. So there's a whole period of time of Victorian medicine where people are trying to figure out about human bodies. How do we communicate what we just found in this cadaver to other people? You got to draw it. You have to illustrate it and you have to illustrate it in fine detail. You got to draw textures. You got to draw lines. You got to draw patterns, all of that stuff. And all of those things are components to both to every single slot in that steam anagram. Mm -hmm. That's not an anagram. What is that? Acronym. <laughs> the other A. Very good. I mean, I hadn't even thought about that, but you're right. Before the photography, a lot of that stuff was just handwritten documented. And I guess to be a really good scientist or engineer, you had to have some artistic ability to be able to communicate your findings. Yeah, those, I mean, those, that's where art has been carried so long and it is by doctors and scientists. And still in other places where we can't, we cannot purchase a nano camera to, to communicate what's going on right now. We just need to draw it. That's why whiteboards are everywhere when you go to hospitals. You got to be able to draw it out. First person I ever saw illustrate for me on a regular basis was my family doctor. I mean, he drew everything that was going on in our bodies. He'd put it on a either a tongue depressor or a napkin or something. He'd draw it out for us. Right. And that was very helpful when you don't have language. You don't care what a big word means, but if you show me a picture of a toenail, I'm going to know <laughs> we're talking about toenails, right? That's right. 
That's right. No doubt. Yeah. Could have picked a better body part. Well, it, you know, this one we can all relate to. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you were talking about earlier about your, your passion for helping people uh, learn al alternative education. And a lot of times when we think about STEM, we think about, you know, hitting the, the high school age, maybe the, even the young college, you know, early career. And, you know, I know you're pretty passionate about, you know, going earlier. So what age do you think leaders need to start thinking on and focusing on to start getting that next generation of those uh, industrial leaders? In my experience, I think, I think that about eight years old is about when you can handle the responsibility of critical thought, problem solving, um, your ego and id don't, don't fire back and forth at each other too much on your interpersonal level. Uh, you can kind of formulate your own thoughts and you feel strong enough to typically support them with additional comments. Um, as you start to get older, we start worrying about who thinks we're cool or smart or, you know, thing, other things start to matter through our adolescent process. But that eight-year-old age is a, is a ripe brain to be picked uh, to start trying to get a wider net of kids thinking about things that they want to do for their future. Because we end up with a whole bunch of high schoolers that want to play basketball professionally or they want to do music professionally and all of those things are wonderful um but it's also great to have some concepts on things that help our civil society function on a daily basis mm -hmm. for sure for sure i mean that that so that's what second third grade somewhere in there that eight year old i think so yeah <laughs> yeah i think that's about it second or third grade yeah it's a, that's a great age. I mean, they 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 absorb so much at that age. They they can still uh, they're still uh, exploring new things, new concepts, new ideas. So I, I'm with you. They're not as concerned about the the gender barriers that that happen later, um, as as kids start to grow. Then it starts to get pocketed into male and female, and and what those binary things mean for those, which trickles down as far as the fields that people choose to study. Right. Um, and I think that that's a huge reason why we end up having more males in the industry than females is because we literally get loped off and we're taught a completely different curriculum than, than the fellows after pretty quickly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is um, no more or less applicable than what they're being taught, but they're, they're just so much closer to, to seeing behind the door than we are. Yeah. Now, when you, when you think about, you know, impressing that eight-year-old or trying to to create an experience for them you think about career fairs usually that's high school even college where these manufacturers these different companies come in they're 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 advocating what they do what what should be done differently because i don't think you would do the same approach for an eight-year-old as you would a, a, a 17 or 18 year old i'm so glad you asked that question the answer to that in my opinion is art uh, you use it as the crux for everything. So career fairs, even as an adult, is a snooze fest to me, right? So I mean, like trade shows, all that stuff, it's wonderful, but there's a time and a place. And really, unless you're passionate about what you're presenting there, it's hard to get anything done. Mm -hmm. um, art's a fantastic way to pretty much relate it to any human because somebody's got an interest. I mean, we're all alive here. And that's basically just social, it's social studies, it's, it's physics, it's sociology, it's... Um, it's history. So all those things, each one of us has some kind of internal motivator that is outside of math and angles. And, you know, that's, that's our humanistic portion that we can kind of relate to the rest of that. Right. For sure. I mean, so from an art standpoint, let's, let's take it another level deeper with an electrical standpoint for someone, if you're trying to, to talk to an eight year old about a career like at TW Controls and what you're doing there now. So you have some pretty cool uh, things behind you there, displays and things to play with. Would, would you be pulling that type of material in to let them get hands on with it? Um, with lower voltage, yeah. Yeah. So I think that uh, I think that with lower voltage, that's a great idea. Um, I actually pulled out a machine recently uh, working on a, an exhibit for the Science Museum. Science Museum, sorry, this is a parlay. Science Museum wants some kind of system that indicates how fast a kid would run through two points. Um, and in that, we need a microcontroller. And I know that some of you guys have heard about microcontrollers, and I don't know a whole lot about them yet, but I'm getting ready to find out all kinds of stuff. But that's a five volt board where kids are able to learn how to program stuff. Five volts is great, you know? Yeah. You don't have to worry about losing your eyesight for very long with that. So that's fantastic. Yeah, it's not going to um, make your hair stand up. Yeah, just for a short period of time. 
Um, but I mean, that's fascinating and that's really, really intricate stuff. And a lot of these kids are just able to regurgitate it. They don't even have to think about it. It's become a second way for them. So these kids are already doing automation. They just haven't connected the two dots. So they're thinking more like robots. Okay, I need this robot that looks like a humanoid features. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I'm going to do with that feature. They're not thinking about, hold on, every single thing that I have in, in a hundred yard distance of me was probably brought to me by some kind of PLC. Um, and if you can learn that, you basically rule the world, you know, like you, you know how to do the whole thing. So, That's right. um, and those grander concepts of not being able to see where it goes or what it does, even people in the industry, not being able to find something relatable for an eight year old, it, it, it becomes more difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, but with conversations like these, we can start to kind of look at it with our kid brain. We have to kind of turn that stuff on every once in a while. What did I think? What would I have thought about this when I was eight? There you go. There you go. Now, you also mentioned uh, uh, something new to me. I'm, I'm sure it's new to some of our listeners as well about Steam Day because it sounded really cool. And I'm thinking, is, now, is that impacting that age group or is it a little bit older? Maybe just explain to us what Steam Day is and what your experience has been with that. Absolutely. So Steam Day is a local initiative here in Roanoke, Virginia that was started. At Virginia Tech is who is responsible for the majority of that, but they've gotten a lot of other industries involved, not industries, but a lot of other big groups of people involved, like the local community college, the art museum, uh, transportation museum. And I think that what everybody notices in this field of STEM uh, and STEAM is that there's enough of us here that we could throw a heck of a party. We can throw a heck of an awakening, you know? We just got to be able to do the right thing in the right order um, with the right types of things that keep a current kid interested in right now. Steam Day uh, was drawing thousands of kids to our area from up to an hour away. So we were coordinating who gets brought, how they get brought, where they're going to go. And the age, grade, the age groups that were involved in that were all the way K through 12. So we're introducing kindergartners. It's hard to do hands-on education with kindergartners with an objective. Like really, you don't want to dim their little child light by making them produce things. Uh, but it's possible to show them and it's possible to have them experience grander concepts of like mixing materials together and seeing what happens. Um, as those kids gain those experience, even if you think you don't get anything out of it that day or within a year, that kid's probably gonna remember it until they're 50 years old. You know, the, that one day we got to do this thing where we had never been allowed to do it before. And uh, it was celebrated that we did it. Like those little markers of agency are the things that keep us enthused in that forever. Mm -hmm. But the original question was Steam Day. So Steam Day uh, is great. So they, we basically would break it up to, into a whole bunch of different facets and send, depending on what age group it is, because you've got a lot of civil engineering on, okay, well, we can't have you know the kindergartners in the transportation museum. That's going to be bad. So trying to put them in the proper locations, we're thinking about uh, caretakers and then also what's the what's the product that we want to come out of it. Well, we want to see people having fun. We want to see people exploring. Okay, well then you just got to put them together in the right spots for that. Nice, nice. So I guess was that the first year of it before the pandemic, or has this been happening in the past? This has been happening in the past. So this year it actually switched right like a month before it we had been planning 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 and it switched about a month before it that we needed to go virtual um so that that was very good everybody on this planet was learning how to do virtual education mm -hmm. and um that that whole school year is going to be interesting to see what happens with it because there was so much of adult energy spent on just trying to get the communication to the kids mm -hmm. um and make it real time, you know, like if we could still send out illustrations, we can do that. But like with worksheets and stuff, when you're in school, you get a visual representation of it, talking, relaying back to the scientific illustrations. It's hard to communicate without pictures. Yeah. And so that's why we wanted that eye to eye engagement. Um, and so when you're doing hands on stuff and the big bada bing bada boom is in the room and you're not, you know, it does create a barrier, but mm -hmm. Ultimately, it was another kind of win because it got a lot of people involved that wouldn't have been able to travel that far to come see us. For sure. And for our listeners, we'll make sure we put in our in our show notes the link to Steam Day so you can check it out for yourself. And, you know, I, I know, Mary, you're very passionate about, you know, other programs. So maybe talk to the parent out there who has a, a, a let's just stick with that eight-year-old. And they want to do more 
themselves to intentionally uh, expose them to steam or just to get them uh, involved more in some of these types of areas, what, what recommendations would you have? Don't give them the answer. You can start at home by just don't don't supply the answer to your kid. Give it give it one minute for them to kind of make a hypothesis. What do you think is going to happen? And it's hard in our everyday world to try to slow up. We're all impatient. We all have things to do. We've got goals we got to meet. If I give this kid a minute, we're going to be 930 getting to bed. Okay, deal with it. Because letting them explore thought on their own and explore those mistakes, make mistakes in the first place. Make sure they're not going to break anything like their arms or their faces. Those are hard to replace. But if they break the object, it was an object the whole time. It was just an object, but they learned how to not break it again. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's in the company that I work for that's really celebrated. If you didn't try it because you were afraid of breaking it, then there's a problem. You need to just go ahead. and It's just an object. Right. Try it. You mentioned some places too that and I know some families may enjoy checking out Mini Maker, Vector Space, you know, places like that. I mean, anything you could expand there? Absolutely. In every area, there are going to be multiple initiatives uh, for types of programs like this. And if not, if, even if you can't personally either pay a fee to get in there, you can always volunteer your time. And just being near people doing that stuff is helpful uh, at doing basically creative thinking exercises. That creative thought is how we think about how to inverse a problem, how to solve it, how to take um, variables away. But uh, one of my favorites that is really good in our area, it's found a way to get teenagers involved uh, on another kind of level is Habitat for Humanity. They pretty much have every layer of, every layer that you can think of in that STEAM agenda that that needs assistance with. Um, And they're finding innovative ways because their name is big enough. They're finding pretty innovative ways to, to get volunteers paid through um, alternative funding. Um, in Lynchburg, Virginia, there's a place called Vector Space, which is pretty dedicated to teaching trade um, in an artful way. And then uh, Mini Maker Fair is a, is a global initiative that allows industries to kind of use that branding to popularize and make their, your own steam day. Roanoke just happens to have both. So the science museum takes on mini maker fair here, Virginia tech really wants to recruit obviously students, but all kinds of stuff. Uh, and so they, they have taken on the, the helm of trying to do giving back through local initiatives for excitement for that. Okay. Um, and so I can't imagine that anybody that would be listening to this wouldn't have access to at least four or five different kinds of programs. And this isn't just like a kid's summer camp where they go and look at robots. All of this stuff is everywhere all of the time. Um, And even small coding groups that are at libraries and access to 3D printers. I mean, this stuff is everywhere. Do not forget about your local library. They usually have one of the coolest 3D printers you've probably ever seen. And it's just sitting in a closet because that's kind of what that stuff does. Unless you have enthusiasts together kind of tackling it because not everybody has answers to everything and it makes it a lot less fun if you have to go google it uh, or look it up in some other way if you guys can kind of commiserate about the problems and it makes it a lot more exciting mm-hmm. for sure so you can gather groups go to the library and use all of their filament to make your wildest dreams come true and then pay your fines and keep it moving right i mean that Sounds sounds wonderful. Great advice for for the listeners out there too. Now you mentioned a couple times funding behind it. I'm not. I don't fully understand how funding works for these types of programs. So how does that work to get industry industry support? Absolutely. Before the pandemic, uh, it worked a little bit differently, uh, and what it will function like after this pandemic will be uh, remarkably different from even that. Uh, where folks find funding for these types of initiatives typically come through grants uh, and other city funding. So you could write to your city and say, I am interested in getting this type of group together. Our goal would be to increase uh, recruitment to several different industries, and this is how we're going to do that. And so you just make a you make an appeal for funding. Um, same thing with grants. Basically, a grant is just asking asking somebody for money, and you're saying, this is what I'm hoping to do with that. Yes, it's really fun for us. We're all into it. Other people that are not into it will 
are usually the ones that are in the rooms that are making the decisions about the money. So you have to really put your heart and soul into it. But um, when everything went online, as far as education, a lot of grants were brought up. A lot of a lot of them were released to institutions like that because they needed them to become education pods. Mm -hmm. And basically what that means is that since those kids weren't able to go to school, they were having to go to other places like a daycare-esque type scenario. Um, when you can find those groups though, uh, and I, I would love to tell people specifically the ones in their areas <laughs> that, are, that are needing help, uh, either physical manual labor help, like they just literally need someone to come by and take out the trash because there's 10% of the people that are involved with it doing 100% of the work, uh, just stopping by and saying, hey, what do you need? Do you need me to sweep the floor or, or what? Uh, do you need me to replug in some wires or reconfigure this computer or update that one those different types of help are another way to be involved without you can obviously spend your own personal money there you know some some people have that to do or they can just pay to participate in programs and that's a really good thing to do if you do have the power to do that i encourage you to look at your own checkbook and say can i pay to sponsor two other slots here so that i got two buddies that wouldn't have been able to come here right. a lot of got to circle back around to that art thing and that steam thing art is the coolest part of that because it's accessible no matter what socioeconomic status you're in you can relate any any i would dare say any lesson that you're going to have in science technology engineering or math and you can use art as a way to communicate what your lesson is for essentially free you can use trash to make art and so if you're using trash to make um a movable object like some kind of automaton um, those, those things are, you don't have to have money to find string and a piece of paper and a needle. You can find that somewhere, but you do have to have money to buy an Arduino, you know, <laughs> it's not going to come to you for free unless you can write a grant for it, unless you can go to the public library, all that stuff costs money too, though. Right. So it's a great way to kind of get everybody involved. And then that way it's not just some people. For sure. I mean, it sounds like too, we need to just be intentional, you know, so far as our at home with our kids as well as industrial leaders out there that are that are that are listening to this you know be intentional about trying to support those types of programs because it's it's through that type of funding too that the sometimes the really cool types of projects and opportunities come to come to fruition intent matters intent is everything on that for sure I mean, this has been, I love your passion. So, I mean, this has been a wonderful conversation. We do call it Eco Ask Why. We, we, we wrap up with the why, and I'm going to tie together a couple of things with this why. Hopefully, well, hopefully you'll tie it together for us, rather. You know, speak to, to the, that industrial leader out there, you know, and we're trying to change their, their mindset to really support programs and focus it on that eight-year-old. I like, I like that, that focus you went to earlier around that, around that eight-year-old. What would be the why? Uh, behind STEAM to impact that eight-year-old in the future? What, what would you, how would you answer that? Our time flies as we, as we're adults, our time, a day is nothing, you know, five years is nothing. In a minute worth of your struggle at work, an eight-year-old, 10 years will pass for them, and then they'll be ready to work for you. Um, to invest in the programs that are there, less specifically. So if you are a micro specific industry and you want to donate money for this micro specific industry, I encourage you to think more broadly. You want people to think critically about physical things, donate money to those things. And you'll see that kind of happen across the board. All it takes is two kids out of 30 that are actually interested to go tell their other two nerd friends that are like, yo, let's, let's go do this. Let's go down this route. Um, and if you give less specifically, just, just, for the sake of manual literacy, it will come back to you tenfold because those manual literacy fanatics were out here doing podcasts and, you know, trying to find ways to interact with our community so that another kid like us that wasn't getting to participate doesn't, doesn't have to wait so long to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So the why would be, it, it's a future investment. If you think that finding people for the jobs that you have is hard now, wait another 10 years. Don't give a check to an eight-year-old. Don't give a check to an industry that teaches eight-year-olds how to do their use their hands and and solve problems. For sure, it'll become even it'll become even more hard. It is. I mean, and that is the number one headwind we hear about that that workforce attrition and and the the work the skills gap. So, you know, these types of initiatives and programs are important. 
You know, and Mary, thank you so much for taking the time with us and for what you did share. We'll make sure that for our listeners in the show notes, links to everything that, that Mary pointed out, the different types of, of programs that you could check out for yourself, as well as a way just to connect with her if you want to learn more uh, from her directly. I know, Mary, you're so passionate about this topic. You, you love sharing with people. So uh, that'll be on our show notes. But thank you so much for your time here. I just love this conversation. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed this. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S. W-H-Y dot com.